Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. Happy Thursday. Um, I just want to start by uh, talking about the loss of Coach Tevens. Uh, Buddy Tevens passed away on Tuesday, uh, a really important person in my life. And um, it was a very sad situation for us um, that that occurred uh, for me, for my family. Um, and for really the coaching profession. I was a student assistant at the University of Florida. Not many people were giving me much of an opportunity, and Coach Tevens did that. Uh, he did that for, for me. I wound up becoming very close with him, spent three years with him at Florida, ended up babysitting his kids on road trips early on, and um, I really want to send my condolences to Kirsten, little buddy, and Lindsay, and um, their families. Um, our friendship never ended. Uh, we were close throughout. Uh, obviously, it was a tragic accident that occurred a few months ago in St. Augustine. Um, but uh, I just wanted to wish the best at Dartmouth football moving forward. Uh, coach McCorkle and I were GAs together. He's now the uh, active head coach there. Coach Shula uh, is a good friend of mine and one of Buddy's best friends. He's also on the staff. And I think there's a lot of irony involved of going to Stanford this weekend where Buddy used to be the head football coach. And um, I spoke with Coach uh, Taylor, asked him if we're going to uh, honor Coach Stevens. He mentioned there'll be a moment of silence prior to the game, um, as well as um, some stickers on helmets uh, in honor of Coach Stevens. But um, I, know that, uh, I know that it's been a really rough few months. So um, I just want to send my condolences to the family. I'll answer any questions about Stanford. Uh, two questions. Uh, first, going along with what you just talked about, what's your fondest memory of Coach Stevens? Oh, there's many because he was an interesting guy. Uh, my fondest memory in a good way was uh, he said we were going to redo Coach Spurrier's play playbook. Coach Spurrier's playbook was all handwritten, and it was never done on a computer. And uh, he, he said, well, this is going to be our task. We're going to do it together. And um, he was... Uh, he was willing to uh, spend a lot of hours with me teaching it to me, and we did that, we did that together. And then there was uh, some great funny memories of, uh, of Coach Stevens. I remember saying uh, he was coaching Riche Caldwell at wide receiver, and he asked Riche if he has a certain release in his repertoire. And um, all the wide receivers looked at Coach Buddy at the same time, and they're like, repertoire? And uh, he just started laughing, and he's like, yeah, I better use some other language. But he never did. He always spoke in the – that Dartmouth education never went away for Coach Stevens, and uh, he was just a fantastic person. And then, uh, earlier this week, uh, Deion Sanders is trademarking – we're trying to trademark – it's personal. Obviously, that's a slogan that you guys have. What's your reaction? Yeah, we tried to trademark that two years ago. Uh, there's four other active trademarks on that already that we were not able to get that. So we, uh, on February 24th of 2021, we trademarked Make It Personal. So we have the trademark on Make It Personal, um, but It's Personal wasn't available when we tried to do that uh, back in 2021. Is that the only thing that's trademarked out of Arizona? Yeah, that's the only thing that's trademarked out of uh, JF Football. Are you just seeding It's Personal to... Coach Prime, he can he can have that one, or do you still sort of feel ownership? Well, I don't I don't think anything other than we've always said it's personal. We we keep it's personal on every uh, we're 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 not seeding anything, uh, but uh, we also don't walk around and say we're the only person that's allowed to say it's personal. We don't walk around and say we're the only person allowed to say we commit, we believe, we whatever it might be. Um, I love Coach Prime. You guys know that. We were together in Baltimore. I think he's great. I think he's great for the game. I think he's a fantastic coach. Um, if he wants to say it's personal in Boulder and we want to say it's personal in Tucson, that's just fine. Uh, Stanford is going to be the first team that you face this year that, that uses a tight end heavily. Um, how do you anticipate uh, covering that and how is that different than just like the standard three wide type thing? Yeah, and the... Their tight end is not just use him heavily, but he's probably their best receiver on their team. He's a very talented player, which now you have to figure out how are you going to cover in man coverage. Are you going to have a safety cover him? Are you going to have a nickel cover him? Are you going to have a linebacker cover him? Um, you got to be able to give multiple looks uh, to a team like that where you have that really elite pass-catching tight end that they want to feed the ball to. I think he has 13 catches this year so far, but I know that they want to feed him the ball more. 
Um, you know, then in your zone coverages, that's where tight ends can really hurt you in zone coverages, um, where they can just find those vacated areas in the middle of the field. I think a lot of us have always seen that. Uh, so we have to be very alert all week long. We've sent three different tight ends down there to give them all the different looks they could possibly get with our scout team. And um, we'll again be aware of it. But that's something that we certainly were it's different than UTEP's use of tight ends, where most of them were blocking tight ends. This is now truly a, a big receiver. Does it help that you have one of your own in your offense, so your, your defense is used to facing that? Yeah, I would say that when you look at what our defense dealt with every day in training camp, they dealt with Tanner McLaughlin, who I think is one of the better tight ends in the country, also wearing 84, and, um, the fact, and then Kean Burnett. So they're accustomed to tight ends stretching the field. They're accustomed to what we do on offense where we flex them out. He plays the outside receiver position. He plays inside. He plays on the, in the core like our guy does. So I do think that our guys will have a little bit more familiarity with defending a tight end because of the way we play versus, you know, the last couple of opponents. Jeff, if you had to characterize basically Troy Taylor in his few seasons as, a, as the head football coach, I mean, what are his teams like? What, you know, what do they do offensively, defensively? Yeah, I don't. I'm, I mean, I don't have much experience um, with Coach Taylor. I know he was at Sac State. He's done a great job. He took a team to made them twelve and one last year. They won thirteen out of the last fourteen or fifteen games, fourteen out of fifteen games, whatever it might be. He certainly built a program. Uh, he did a great job at Utah. Uh, he's a, a you know he's a quarterback, so he's got a quarterback mentality. Uh, there's a calmness about him that you when you're around him, he just feels like a very good person. I don't know him very well. Um, I would be um, just kind of talking if I was just to say more than that, but I think he's done a great job uh, where he's been, and I know he's going to do a great job at Stanford. Uh, Stanford has E.J. Smith, son of Emmett Smith. Uh, you have a few uh, you know, guys who come from NFL families. What's different about these guys and just how they approach the game? Yeah, I was hoping that E.J. would go to my alma mater, Emmett's alma mater, you know what I mean, and keep him on the East Coast. Uh, I don't know what he's doing all the way out here. But um, I would say Isaiah Taylor, right, is one example. Upshaw is another example. Uh, Patu's dad played in the NFL. Um, you know, you have guys that have worn, and obviously Isaiah, whose dad wore a gold jacket, you know. Uh, they grew up in the game. They know the game of football. They know what it's like. And uh, Kean Burnett's dad was drafted out of here. So it's nice to have guys that have that football lineage. It's nice to have the guys that know the game, have the football gene in it. Um, and they also, their parents understand. You know, they understand what it takes. They're supportive on the phone. They're supportive with the kids. And uh, I'm sure that uh, EJ is going through the same thing uh, with his dad. Uh, your last road game involved cowbells, a pretty raucous environment. Stanford maybe isn't known for, for having something similar or super engaging and all that. Is that something that can play into it, that there isn't as much crowd noise? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting that you say that. Uh, we've talked about with our team, you've got to create our own energy in this game, right? Our responsibility as a team is to show up there and create our own energy, not worry about or try to need the fans to not like you to get excited. We don't need the fans to boo you when you run out. We don't need our own fans to get us going like we would on a home game. This is up to us. Um, the 74 players that we bring, the 30 staff members that we bring, those are the responsible people to get, to, to get us to play a much better game than we did the last time we were in Northern California, um, where we did not uh, bring our own energy. We did not uh, play to the standard that we want to play in, and we're learn we've learned from that, I hope, and uh, I've certainly emphasized it enough. Um, how come Roberto Miranda, Roberto Miranda is not on the depth chart even though he plays pretty regularly? <laughs> Jeff? Roberto Miranda should be on the depth chart. Uh, I think we, yeah, Robert, so Roberto Miranda is, um, you know, where he, he really has helped us is his ability to be a great blocker, run blocker, pass protector. Uh, you could see uh, the value he has uh, in those situations. He's also, um, he, he's sneaky as a pass catcher every now and then. He kind of sneaks in there in practice and catches some balls for us. But um, his physicality, his want to, his know-how, um, 
he's an interesting story, obviously, uh, coming from Germany. And he's really done a, a great job of learning our system. And this year, specifically, um, it really started in a lot of spots. Whenever we went 12 personnel, he was our starting tight end. Now we're rotating between he and Kean uh, when, we, when we go into those uh, personnel groupings. But uh, both of them bring great value. But yeah, Roberto's done a really good job for us. Practices his tail off, came back from an ACL injury. And um, yeah, that's, that's a mistake on my part. And, uh, how has Polito looked in practice? Good. Polito's good to go. Uh, full contact, uh, Tuesday's practice, Wednesday's practice, fully cleared. We'll keep him off the bicycle tonight. Um, we've asked him to actually walk around with a helmet, not just ride a bike with a helmet. So we're good on both accounts there. And uh, as long as we don't make any... Uh, slip-ups, potholes, or anything like that, which he might have caused when he fell, um, we have definitely uh, should be better. Just to kind of, Jed, continue on that, uh, the tight end blocking, just uh, I'll be like the job that Tanner's done there, uh, kind of sealing off that edge, and then Leif came in and, and really looked like he performed well. What was special about what he was able to do and him coming back from the struggles that he's had? Leif at guard and Tanner at tight end. Um, well, last week we certainly saw uh, a combination of a good group of uh, run blocking, right? The, the combination of guys, they all work really well together. Uh, Tanner, for all the games that he's played, he's continued to grow in that, in that role. And what, you know, the NFL wants to know, right, are you a willing blocker? That's the first question they ask all tight ends, right, that are known for their pass catching abilities. He's not only a willing blocker, he's worked extremely hard at becoming a good blocker. Uh, playing with good pad level, playing with better leverage, understanding the importance of being able to step with the right foot. You know, one of the things that you get accustomed to when you're a tight end is you're constantly releasing out. You're always arc releasing. You're running seam routes often. You're running flat routes often. So you're always stepping with your outside foot. So what he's had to work on is with his, whenever we're running inside run game, he has to step with his inside foot. And some of those things are all training and practice, and he's done a really nice job there. Uh, when it comes down to Leif, uh, after coming off of a little foot injury that happened that week leading up to NAU game, uh, he did a really nice job of coming back, stepping, you know, coming back into uh, the fold. I think he might have had 20 or so plays in the game and um, gives us that depth that we've been talking about. We all like to talk about the defensive line depth and the ability you have to rotate. But when you have offensive line depth that I think we've had, we have here that we haven't had here in a long time, you know, when you have eight or nine guys at the 300-pound mark, eight or nine guys at that 6'4-plus mark, um, you know, you have a chance to really be able to stay fresher, maybe get a few more guys in the rotation, and also uh, be able to handle whatever obstacle goes your way. Last question, Justin. Uh, what exactly happened with Toledo and his bike accident? <laughs> I think he was trying to get up on a curb, and I think the bike, him and the bike didn't get along there for a second. And then, uh, when you look at just, I mean, the schedule beyond this week, how do you think this week can, can set you guys up? What's the message to the guys? We have to win this week. That's the message to the guys. We have to come back home three and one. And we have to sell out this place when we get back home. And that's the, uh, the message to the guys. And that's the only focus, you know, I've heard the saying one and oh, go one and oh this week. Okay, we have to go one and oh this week. Uh, we have to come back with a win. We have to play our best football in Palo Alto on Saturday. We have to come back. We, we were playing a, um, a really good football team in our first Pac-12 game. And we've lost to them, I think, six times in a row. And if there's any question whatsoever about the importance of this game, it's when you've gone there, you haven't beaten the Cardinal in six, year, in six different attempts. As I've said before, I said to our team, this is a program that, you're take, that in the last 20 years has had Jim Harbaugh and David Shaw. And this program has been established and built to win, and we have to expect them uh, to come back and uh, give us their best shot on Saturday, and we've got to give them our best shot. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Who's heading to Palo Alto? Justin? Okay. Sheer? No go. Okay. Sheer, you going to be at the UW game? Okay, good.